Hello everyone, this is Philosophy for the People. I'm Stefan Bertram and I'm here with Ben Burgess. And today we're going to be talking about Peter Singer and Palestine, and perhaps more generally about kind of um, being a, a Western liberal intellectual and trying, well, specifically a philosopher, and trying to interface with issues like Palestine of geopolitical importance. Um, a while back on Reddit as Philosophy, someone linked uh, a series of articles on some kind of mid-tier news and opinion website, which I can't remember the name of, but you wouldn't know the name probably if you had heard it. And they were like, are these real Peter Singer essays? Because it, it says his name, but I'm looking at these, these essays and they're shit. So like, what's going on here? And so I investigated and I found on his Twitter linking to one of these articles, proving that they were his. And especially the one that this person was taking umbrage with was one where he just, he was attempting to argue that fat people should pay more to fly on planes um, because they're fat and that requires more fuel and that's utilitarianism. Um, so just maybe the commentary that maybe his uh, kind of utilitarian skills in, in popular opinion pieces have, have diminished with time. His powers have, have been uh, have been fading uh, as the decades go by. Yeah, that's possible. That's possible. I, I am I actually try to be a little bit more charitable in the essay, but that's uh, that's an interesting uh, you know <laughs> very simple hypothesis there for what might be going wrong. Right. You, I mean, it's, your take is more interesting, certainly, for us to, to discuss something about it. So I'm glad you made it instead of mine that of, of maybe he's just a bit shit now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. As he ages, his brain is turning to mush. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe not right now, stuff of the stars, but eventually, yes. I'll save your comment. Okay. Um, oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, yeah. You read the message, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think, um, this is, this is actually kind of funny because today two things happen to come out at the same time. Uh, one is the essay we're going to talk about because of course it's Sunday. It's philosophy for the people day. Uh, you know, the essay is always scheduled to come out Sunday morning. And then the other is that uh, Jacobin uh, just happened to, um, you know, I filed it a few days ago, but they just happened to put out today a article that I wrote for them where I'm um, actually, you know, talk about this more in the show tomorrow, but I'm actually in the extremely unusual for me position of, uh, of delivering some news and not just commenting on it. Uh, Cause uh, you know, that's uh, you know, usually, you know, usually it's just a uh, punditry, but uh, in this particular case, there's a, uh, there's a reader in um, Tel Aviv who, uh, who, who dug up this old quote from a uh, Israeli newspaper in the eighties where uh, said the Senator from, from Delaware, Joe Biden, uh, had, uh, yeah, was um, approving. Tell apparently told Menachem Begin in uh, 1982 that he uh, uh, that he was all for what Israel was doing in Lebanon, and explained by way of comparison that if uh, terrorist attacks were launched from Canada, uh, we'd be completely justified in uh, wiping out all of the cities in in Canada in response. Which is, uh, you know, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd be very curious about what the Canadians think about this. <laughs> but, uh, well, they're, they're losers in that case, so who cares what they think? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so that that's some actual news. And, of course, this is uh, the opposite of that. This is, you know, this is thinking about a philosopher and, uh, and, and what, you know, what he said about it. And I should say that Peter Singer's comments on this sort of first came to my attention because I saw uh, Enzo Rossi um, was uh, had had tweeted about it, and um, but then you know I saw 
that Singer had uh, shortly after those tweets that he had written this article for uh, Project Syndicate, um, where uh, he more or less said the the same thing in. Uh, oh my God, I missed that! Wow. Okay. Uh, Norman Michaela, that is a uh, that's a that is a combination. Uh, that's a combination anyway. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I had, um, so the project syndicate piece more or less says what he says in the tweet in a, uh, in a longer form. And then, uh, apparently after he wrote that, he considered him to have said his piece. This is all that really needed to be said about the matter. Since, since then, as far as I can tell, uh, I've been paying more attention to his Twitter feed uh, since then. Um, He's just been posting about fat people. <laughs> I haven't seen anything about fat people in airplanes, but I have seen him. Uh, I have seen him tweet a lot about stuff like uh, you know the ethics of AI and whether the non-human suffering of non-human animals shows there's no God, and you know just a sort of topics of generally Peter Singerish interest, right? So I think that the uh, <laughs> I think that the the Palestine question kind of only caught his attention for a minute. The the thing with the the essay was it was even worse than I expected because I thought you'd be saying like it's really bad because it's like offensive, but I found it really bad just because it's like empty basically. It's like he basically said like what if actually the best thing is for things to currently go along as they currently are going and and in in accordance (laughs) with what the Israeli government uh, says will happen in the future. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, look, it's not that it's not that Peter Singer is some like hardcore, like um, you know, Kahanist or something. I mean, like nothing, nothing like it. Of course, right? He's a, he's a. In fact, I think that the I think that the particular form of vapidity that's on display in this essay is kind of what you would expect from a certain kind of, as you said earlier, Western liberal intellectual. Um, and, and yeah, in a, in a way that makes it more interesting. I mean, it's not just that, like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I remember that the, uh, I've, I've had multiple people tell me that the, uh, the late Saul Kripke uh, just, just happened to have like, aggressively and horrifyingly right-wing views about Israel uh, that, you know, he would sometimes share. Uh, For for next week, uh, I'm doing a guest essay next week about just war. Um, And the kind of traditional defender of of just war, the biggest one is is Michael Walzer. Um, And I Googled him and I found out he was insanely Zionist. Um, So Zionist that when the, the Corbyn thing was happening in the UK, he was like, the problem it doesn't really matter if Corbyn is anti-Semite because anti-Zionism is just that much of a crime in of itself. Anti-Zionism is the real problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, that sounds like Walter. I mean, what, I, I actually think Walter is a sort of interesting combination of uh, somebody who there are like a fair amount of abstract things that he has correct or at least plausible things to say about but uh he just uh yeah i mean ultimately i mean he he seems to be the kind of um you know he seems to be just like the worst kind of social democrat and foreign policy in general uh and unsurprisingly on on israel in particular you know i'm i'm always reminded if there's this essay that uh christopher hitchens wrote in the 80s about uh a group called social democrats usa which if you don't know your, uh, um, your, I guess, center left arcana, uh, sectarian arcana, uh, that's when the old socialist party of, you know, Norman Thomas and all of that, uh, basically, uh, was basically shattered into a few pieces. Uh, one of those pieces who are the people who are sort of most stay in the course of what it had been, became the Socialist Party USA, which is a relatively obscure group now. Uh, And then um, what ended up being the largest piece ended up becoming the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, Mm -hmm. which ultimately uh, merges with another group to become DSA. And then uh, there's this other small piece 
that um that's like basically the people like the Shackmanites uh who uh who become uh the rapidly right wing drifted drifted uh, Shackmanites become social democrats USA and they're like you know very all in on the democratic party stuff they're very all in on on Israel on sort of cold war you know the kind of position that's sometimes called state department socialism you know during the cold war and um so there's a point an essay in the uh 80s where hitchens went to one of their meetings and he jokes that you know they should be called you know social democrats usa usa uh you know and waltzer waltzer kind of strikes me as a little bit that kind of guy um you mean, know but it's very consistent he wrote a, a, an article last winter explaining why based on his theories of just war russian soldiers can't commit no injustice by joining the russian army ah that is consistent <laughs> but yeah so, I, I think this kind of consistent attitude is just like an acceptance of incredible death but we'll get to that next week yeah um, for, for, for sure right so it, it's not that it's not that singer um uh, is is some like awful pro-israel zealot because if he was in some ways uh it would be less interesting because it would just be like okay well look i mean people have views before they show up to do philosophy and right. so, you know, singer, no, known for his crazy takes on killing children and, and eating fat people or whatever <laughs> has examined Israel Palestine and decided actually things should stay exactly as they are, which is interesting and strange in its own way, in its own boring sort of way. Yeah. I mean, the, like the thing that strikes me as interesting about this is, is methodological. In other words, that um, it's not that Peter Singer just happened to have some sort of horrible view on this and he continued to have it right. As he, as he went on his career as a philosopher, it's that I think that he, I think that he he ends up with, in effect, some pretty horrible views. I mean, I think he thinks of himself as being very sort of fair and reasonable, and you know, kind of uh, you know, kind of taking taking things down, um, you know, like sort of okay, I'll you know, sure, I could see that, but I could see this too, right? I mean, like I think he thinks that's what he's doing. I think the I think that the sort of end of the day stand he's taking is actually pretty horrifying um, in in effect, right? But like I think that the way he ends up there is telling because I think it it says something about um, you know look I'm obviously somebody who likes philosophy, but uh, I think you know and and you know I actually start the essay by talking about. Uh, Slavoj Žižek, who I think is a sort of uh, has has had a comparably honorable uh, record on this one, right? And uh, but like I, I think that it it says something about the sort of limits of what philosophy trains you to be good at uh, yeah. as they as they apply to trying to understand um, you know things material. you don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, trying to understand things that are going on out there in material reality that can't be derived from first principles. Um, so do you want to kind of surmise what he actually gets to and what your response to? I don't think that'll take long, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically what Singer says in the original tweets is, um, is okay, the Netanyahu government is horrible, granted... But, you know, that doesn't justify, you know, what, you know, Hamas did. And which, I will just, which just seems a bit of a non sequitur, really, like. Sure. Right. Like, like, it all just pause here. I mean, we were kind of joking about this before we went on air about, you know, the, uh, the sort of nonstop demands to condemn Hamas. But like, sure, if anybody cares, I'll do it. You know, that's like. Uh, yeah, I, I, I find it very pointless <laughs> to condemn them, but I will accept that they're bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I think Hamas is very bad and that Hamas does very bad things. I think that, like... Yeah, they, they do bad things to achieve bad ends. Yes, exactly. I, I think that the... Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I obviously could not be ideologically further from Hamas, right? Like, that's, uh, you know, I, I'm a secular socialist, you know, who, who wants to have equal rights for everybody and they're 
you know, ethno nationalist, uh, religious fundamentalists. So, you know, yeah, what do you expect? Uh, that's, uh, so, um, it's a, you know, so yeah, but I, I think it's also like a bit of a, I also kind of think that those like 45 seconds that I just spent were probably a little longer than, uh, it's worth spending on this because, yeah. uh, it kind of goes without saying, I mean, the entire, like, you know, you have to go so far out onto the fringes to find somebody who doesn't dislike Hamas. Yeah, and, I mean, people, people did genuinely get quite excited in the first day, but as soon yeah. as they found out that they'd like massacred a rave, everyone like shut up and delete their tweets, which is fine. Yeah, by and large, yeah, right. I mean, it's like, um, and and even the people who got excited the first day. I mean, that's not like that's like a certain. It's like a certain version of left Twitter. It's not, you know, it's not yeah, like yeah. it's hype Twitter. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, guys who think Hezbollah are like super soldiers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nobody is. Uh, you know, let's put it this way: no, nobody who's saying things like that, you know, has like a, you know, has like a seat in Congress, or you know, is uh, or 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 is even like the president of like a mid-sized local trade union. Uh, that's uh, so like, yeah. And meanwhile, of course. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, I would think that condemning Hamas was a higher priority if, um, you know, if the United States was spending billions of dollars uh, shipping weapons to Hamas. Right, and- they're already a terrorist organization. It is literally a crime for me to praise them. So you <laughs> demanding I not praise them seems very pointless. Yeah. Unless you're doing it kind of pragmatically to make sure I don't go to prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just like, yeah, sure. I mean, like, even in the United States where we have the First Amendment, so, you know, people can be idiots on this question if they want to. Like, that's, uh, it's, you know, yeah, sure. Yeah, bad people do bad stuff. But um, that's, you know, making a big show of it, I think, kind of misses the point, you know, when you have violence on a much bigger scale being conducted against civilians by a state that... Um, that you know my government your government uh other western governments uh are certainly providing enthusiastic rhetorical support to and certainly in our case also uh military and financial support uh you know diplomatic support uh and and like kind of ideologically moral like carte blanche yeah Um, i don't know if you've seen but the labor party in the uk has had loads of different ministers be asked like, is it okay for Israel to do things which are literally directly war crimes? And they're like, yeah. Yeah, I've seen a little bit of that. Uh, I That is, uh, that's like, there's something, I don't know, like this iteration of, uh, of, of British labor centrism seems like somehow... I mean, I'm not going to say it's in an absolute way worse than like the player iteration because, like, obviously, whatever. But like, it's uh, there's there's something that's sort it, it, of it, it is. It's just that, but more hollowed out. Like, yeah, there's there's something that's like, like Tony Blair had grand plans to do shit things. Yeah, exactly. Like, Obama's never going to invade Iraq. He's just going to like make a tweet about how it would it would be good actually if we did. Yeah. Yeah, it's just sort of an emptier and more craven version of it now. Um, that's um, yeah. Uh, but in uh, so so look, uh, I, I I think that the first tweet, it's like okay, it's a little pointless, but fine, yes. Um, but the second tweet is like okay, and I'm sure lots of people will die, but uh, but it's it's actually good and important to uh to to destroy hamas now and then he goes into this uh a little bit more in the project syndicate article and he has this thing it's actually kind of a weird flourish like um for for peter singer like i i I wonder if the editor suggested it because it's like um stylistically like it, it sort of almost has more like the form of something in like a Zizek essay where at mm-hmm. the end he's like, you know, paradoxically, it's actually yeah. going to be good for the Palestinians to, uh, to do this because uh, if Israel destroys Hamas, you know, cause Hamas, Hamas by its actions has tainted the Palestinian cause. And so, 
Therefore, essentially, the line of thought seems to be that the um, that it's going to um, that when Hamas is gone, there's no more Hamas. Then, uh, then like Western liberals will once again sympathize with the Palestinians, and this will which, which felt very strange because the, if we're talking about the general public, then the Western public already does actually sympathize. <laughs> but presumably, what he, he means is not the Western public, but you know, a couple hundred members of the Western public who sit in parliaments. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to say. Cause like, as you said, um, you know, even in the United States right now, um, there's like, there's polling on this. And uh, even though you wouldn't guess it from the near uniformity of politicians in support for what Israel's is doing, um, you it was know nine that seven zero in the Senate, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Right, they're like in in Congress. Out of the four hundred thirty five members of Congress, there I don't know. As of a few days ago, is fifteen. It might be a couple more now. You know who who co signed the uh, ceasefire uh, resolution. So you know it's a it's it's great. It's way better than it would have been in the past, but it's still a tiny minority of the uh, the body as a whole. Right, you know, fifteen or so out of four hundred thirty five. Uh, so yeah, 60, like, 64 in the UK. Hey, <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, but yeah, like, so the politicians are lockstep, uh, behind Israel, but then like, if you actually look at polling, um, there's actually a pretty big majority of the American public, uh, that, um, that, that supports, that thinks the U S should support like a ceasefire and de-escalation, uh, in Israel, Palestine, you know, and um, which percentage <laughs> of people in the UK said there should definitely not be a ceasefire in, What's in that? Palestine? What's that? Uh, w- one. <laughs> okay. Which is, which is a group of, uh, of, of clearly the percentage that uh, supports the policies of, of, of Starla and uh, Sunak on the issue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's like it's it's like the. Uh, it's like the joke about how every single never Trump Republican already has a job at the New York times uh, that like the, uh, that's like, yeah, this is the 1% of the population that entirely consists of pundits and, you know, parliamentarians. Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah. So it's not as good in the U S but between somewhat agree and, and strongly agree, it's like about, you know, nearing like two thirds of the public once the ceasefire, And in, uh, and in fact, even 56% of Republicans, uh, are either somewhat or strongly agree on a ceasefire. Uh, so it's it's kind uh, of psychotic, not to like, if you're asked the question of should two countries, if neither of which are yours should go to peace, like, how do you say no to that? Really? Yeah. There's something very wrong with you. If you're like, no, 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 I want them to keep fighting. Um, yeah. So. So it's there is this there is this big disconnect there and and I I mean I think it's I think it's kind of telling about the limits of Singer's mental world that he's going to frame it in this way because it's like um, I mean I I don't know I mean I have to say like I suspect what it means is like somebody like him who's like a uh, you know who's a Princeton professor divides his time between Australia where he's from and you know and uh, the U.S. Uh, is a pretty prominent person so spends like a you know a fair amount of time uh you know schmoozing with people who even other princeton professors might not etc right like like i think what he really kind of means is that like he ha- he sort of has a sense that in his world there's like all this less sympathy for palestinians now and you know he thinks okay you know, basically one of the things I say in the essay is that part of the absurdity of this is that he's writing about it as if like destroying Hamas as if like maybe on like, you know, Bibi Netanyahu's desk, there's a button that says destroy Hamas. And the question is like, okay, do you press the button or do you not press the button? And it's like, okay, well, once he presses the button, uh, then, you know, Hamas is gone. And then everything. Can just- 5% of the civilian population of Gaza is gone. Right. But that's fine because he's utilitarian. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it, and it is interesting the way he sort of acknowledges that and sort of doesn't, you know, we can get to that. But he has the, uh, the way he, you know, the way he talks about it, it's like, okay, well, once Hamas is gone, uh, then everything can kind of reset and like be more reasonable now. 
which strikes me as a bizarre way to think about how um how how war you know, all this stuff works in the real world that like um because why would you assume like okay first of all the number of counterinsurgency campaigns around the world that have the declared goal of making some guerrilla force cease to exist versus the number which actually result in the permanent non-existence of that force right i mean it's like why why would you think that like the end result of all this will just be like like literally there's no more hamas i think that's a big assumption but two even if for the sake I mean, of our israel did get pretty close in the west bank but you know failed in lebanon and so on yeah i mean even if you even if even if it was right even if you did like like even if hamas was completely wiped out along with god knows what percentage <laughs> of the palestinian population um then okay what happens to like it's not like then you know it's like oh you just take this piece off the chessboard and everything else stays the same uh you've just created all of these palestinians who have seen i mean i remember god this was i don't know what the number is likely to be now but it was like pretty early days uh last week when um the um uh, the authorities in Gaza said that there were 45 families that uh, were completely wiped off the registry. Every single generation of the family had been uh, had been wiped out. Uh, there's a like, if you think about all of the Palestinians who have had the experience of um, of of watching all of their friends and relatives uh, die horribly, of um, of you know these expulsion orders uh of maybe hiding out in the greek orthodox church uh because it seemed like a safe place for refuge and having that bombed etc they, blew, they uh, blew a fucking anglican hospital up it seems like there's a um uh you know it seems like quite a few of these people just you know humans being humans uh are not going to come out of that as Peter Singer approved uh, nice liberal two state people, right? They're, they're, the, um, the, the founder of Hamas, um, his father was born in a village outside what is now Ashkelon, this city uh, on the border with um, Gaza that was, um, was being rocket attacked and infiltrated by Hamas in the early days. Uh, um, and then his family was expelled from there and moved to Gaza among many people in the Nakba. And, you know, it must have been this very particular kind of grievous wound to be ex expelled from this place, which you could literally see from the Gazan border. Yeah, right. And so it's like, it, it seems to me just as likely that the long-term consequence of this would be that, you know, yeah, even if Hamas did cease to exist, which is a big if, but even if it did, um, you know, whatever comes next uh, could could be even worse than. Uh, right, like how 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 many Israeli soldiers have died in the past twenty years? From, right. Prior to the events of October seventh, I think it's a, a, a few hundred, maybe. And the number of uh, Israeli civilians that have died is a similar number. It's certainly less than a thousand. How uh, many just Israeli soldiers would die in a ground operation against Hamas? It's going to be a much bigger number than that. Yeah, I mean, just the idea that this is going to make, uh, you know, peace more likely uh, in the long term in the future um, seems to rely on on a fairly bizarre understanding of of how any of this actually works in the real world. Like the, the, the kind of best option for the Gaza Strip in, in the case of Israel winning is for them to become the West Bank. And presumably the West Bank is a, is a situation of immense injustice, even to Pia Singer. Totally, right? And, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there have already been Israeli officials who've said things, you know, to their American counterparts like this operation, you know, this, this might take 10 years. Uh, that's so, yeah, I mean, that is uh, also very openly said that they don't have a plan uh, for, uh, yeah, for like, you know, we'll, we'll probably be in there for about two months. Which, you know, the Russians thought they'd been in Ukraine for three days, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, uh, you know, it, it seems um, 
you know, this all seems pretty obvious. It's also like, there's also something, it's also very odd the way that singer kind of short changes the whole issue of, um, of Palestinian uh, civilian death. Uh, he basically says two things about it. Uh, one is when he's in the first part of the article, when he's talking about how bad Hamas is, he says uh, that, well, they killed, you know, Israeli civilians, which they knew would lead to, you know, lots and lots of Palestinian civilians being killed. And it's like, okay, but this is also interesting because in this, in this, um, in this way of telling the story, Hamas has agency, but the IDF doesn't. That they, right, uh, which I think is a kind of fascinating ideological move. And exactly what I was thinking is that the whole thing is we need to completely invert that kind of thinking where, you know, if Hamas was destroyed, if, yeah. oh, if, if Hamas surrendered today, yeah. had to all their weapons and so on and yeah. so forth, uh, that would not lead to, a, to, to justice in Gaza. It would lead to, at the very best, them becoming the West Bank. Um, you know, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, their their airport in 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 Gaza was blown up before before Hamas took control. Um, but if we think about that's the kind of maximal power that Hamas have. Basically, you know, they're going extremely one way now, and if but if they're completely the other way, the the result would be that they they they're tr- transformed into the West Bank. What can Israel do? Israel can do so many different things. Yeah, has like, power like, to like, change so much. But we're talking about what Hamas should be doing. Yeah, exactly. Like, like there's Israel is clearly the party involved here with by far the most power to affect the outcome. I mean that they that it it occupies the West Bank. It is, um, you know, whatever. It ceded certain kinds of internal control to Gaza, but like it has a, but in in many 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 important ways it's completely controlled gaza uh the uh, the entire time uh as we have seen because it is an, you know it is a position to turn off the water and electricity anytime at once you know completely controls the borders etc uh yeah, no israeli israeli state people have been saying well you know we don't have an obligation to be supplying water and so on do for, for of course you do. And it's like, well, what are the circumstances such that you have to be doing that? It wasn't free market competition that they happened <laughs> to outsource all their kind of water and electric to you. Yeah, it? you just got the you just you just outbid all the other people who are going to do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, they talk about I don't care about international law, but under in, international law, an occupying power has no rights in terms of what they can do to the people they're occupying. They're Obligation is to withdraw as soon as possible, and saving that is to to care for the local population, of yeah. which of course yeah. they do literally the opposite in every way. Yeah, if you completely control the borders, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, you have a uh, decide. You know, everything comes in and out is under your control. Then, like, yes, obviously, uh, if you are going to illegally continue to do all that, right, then then you have taken on the obligation to continue to ensure the basic necessities of life for people who live there. You know, you can't pretend that it's an independent state for the purposes of saying we don't have an obligation to provide these things. I mean, Israel's favorite thing is to be like, we, we have a right to defend our borders. And, and you know, the Westerners say that too. Yeah. And it's like, well, what are your borders then? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Tell us what your borders are, and then withdraw to those. Right? That would uh, that would be that would be defending your borders. Um, yeah. No, exactly. So, uh, so that's one reference. This sort of very bizarre thing, where the only the group that holds far fewer cards is the only one that's assigned any sort of agency. Uh, Israel's, um, you know, and you know, obviously, also he's doing the thing that you know, uh, in effect, even though he does, to be fair, he talks earlier in the piece about some of the previous history of the conflict, but, you know, in his framing in that line, he's definitely doing the thing that so many people have done in the last two weeks where they, um, where, uh, they have, uh, they basically start the clock at two weeks before yesterday, uh, as 
this is like the first event and then everything else is a reaction to that rather than that being a reaction to anything that had uh that had taken place uh before that and you know and and yeah just just kind of portraying israel's reaction as if it's like a law of nature rather than a decision but you know hamas is making a decision is not only very arbitrary but is yes for all the reasons you just laid out i think i think kind of backwards you know not that hamas doesn't have agency but that you know israel obviously is in the most position to impact the outcome so that's one of the two references uh to that and then the other one is like a couple sentences where he's like right in the middle of like you know talking about this and he's about to go back to saying yep go for it destroy hamas where he says okay uh, it's not okay for them to to turn off the water and electricity and everything, which is um, which sort of suggests, like, you know, I, I mean, I think the most charitable reading of it, you know, is you're saying, okay, well, I don't like the way that they're doing it, but I would like hypothetically like it if um, if they did this in a completely different way, which to me seems just as pointless as saying. Um, I'm all for the Hamas incursions uh, two weeks uh, before yesterday, but um, but I don't like the way they did it. I wish they'd done it, you know, a different way. It's like, well, yeah, I wish I wish they just cut out the bits which weren't, you know, dragging guys out of barracks in their pants or whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's a fantastic military operation, but which they cut with, you know, wiping out kibbutz or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, well, okay, given everything about Hamas and their ideology and history and et cetera, this was like obviously what they were going to do. And given everything about the IDF, this right now is obviously what they're going to do, right? That the uh, this um, this total siege of the civilian population, um, indiscriminate bombing, et cetera. I mean, this is what... Uh, yeah, exactly. Those are the options. Two weeks ago or three thousand years ago, uh, those the uh, those those are the two Western moves here. Uh, but in um, but like yeah, this is how they were going to do it. Like just saying like that hypothetically, you would support a force doing something if they did it in a way that they're just not going to do it, given everything you know about them. I mean t- that's. You know, I'd say in the essay, I mean, this is just kind of pointless idea fanfic at that point, right? You know, you're not you're not interacting with uh, the range of things that might happen in uh, in the real world, right? So this is so this is the objection to uh, you know this is the objection to Singer, but like what maybe makes this more interesting than just like hey, you know, here is kind of a vapid Western liberal uh, talking himself into supporting war crimes, which, you know, I mean, whatever, that's dime a dozen on the editorial pages of uh, most newspapers in the English speaking world. Uh, That's is, well, hold on. This is, this is Peter Singer doing this. And, and, you know, (laughs) like some of the, some of the more eyebrow raising takes you were mentioning earlier, notwithstanding, um, <laughs> you know, Peter Singer is not a dumb guy, right? He is um, like, there is a, you know, there is a reason actually that he has the level of prominence that, um, that, that he does um, that he's certainly the leading representative of uh, utilitarianism, which whatever I don't endorse, but is certainly right. Like if, if if you told me about like Peter Singer has an insane take on Israel Palestine, like without reading it or without knowing your take on it, I would assume he said something that no one else has said. <laughs> yeah, 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 because he does that a lot. Uh, it's like Hamas needs to win, but go vegan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah so so sometimes singer will take you know so his you know his utilitarianism so he doesn't you know he he doesn't believe that uh there are any morally important considerations except for maximizing good consequences minimizing bad ones like sometimes he will take these to some very strange places right he's certainly done that before i will say that um sometimes like I actually do think that there's like a version of like the sort of thing that people will say when they're defending Sam Harris, that's actually true about singer. It's not really true about Harris that like um, that sometimes people who, uh, 
you know, who are sort of reading quickly and unsympathetically uh, will, um, you know, will kind of take him going where his argument leads and, and conflate that with like a worse position. That's um, like the obvious case is, is the stuff about, uh, about disability that, you know, right, he, there's basically no circumstances in which he actually endorses infanticide. Yeah. Like the kinds of circumstances in which he endorses infanticide are genuinely are incredibly rare. It's, it's not like, you know, when people hear like killing disabled babies, the kind of disabilities they're thinking about are not what Singer's talking about, which are like uh, these incredibly rare conditions where somebody is like born without a brain, you know, thing, things like, like things like that. Um, so that, that would be an example, you know, I think of, uh, of, of that, right. That, yeah, he does, you know, he has bitten some bullets, but oftentimes they're not as big as people, as people think they are on closer investigation. And I will also say though, to, to be fair to Singer, um, that, okay, obviously what he's best known for is his utilitarianism and places that he takes that, which are sort of, um, you know, generally morally admirable, uh, like, you know, look, I think factory farms really are pretty bad and it's, uh, it, it's, and, and there is something that's admirable about calling attention to that. Um, or, you know, or trying to, you know, at least think about how to get more resources mm -hmm. to famine victims. And then of course the play times that he's like bit weird utilitarian bullets, uh, like, you know, the kind of thing we've been talking about or, you know, is at least perceived as biting weird utilitarian bullets. But I will say, to be fair to Singer, although I think this is actually ultimately going to shed some light on where he goes wrong, but to be fair to Singer, I think that he's actually, um, like, he doesn't just make all of his arguments like, okay, utilitarianism, therefore, you know, X. Uh, he, he oftentimes will actually make pretty careful arguments where in which he understands that most of the rest of us think that there are non-utilitarian considerations that are morally important. And he'll grant that for the sake of argument and sort of explore what would be true given, you know, various principles that, you know, he himself doesn't accept. And sometimes I think he actually, you know, I think he actually does a good job with that. Right. So I think that, um, you know, in the essay I mentioned, Uh, is that? It's just Ben that's gone. Sure. I'm all right, I think. Oh no! Hi, I... you're back. I think. Oh, weird. Okay, I didn't realize I was gone. Only it was only for like three seconds. Okay, so the example I was, I was saying I gave in the uh, the essay is uh, you know as he wrote this uh, this book that came out in 2004 about George Bush uh, called the President of Good and Evil. He basically the uh the premise of the book is basically he uh george bush you know talked a lot more about morality than uh most politicians do he mm -hmm. used the word evil a lot more than most politicians mm -hmm. do axes so, of them. old axes yeah, exactly right uh yeah like bush bush really liked the word evil so the book's called the president of good and evil the uh ad, you know respond to the ethics of george w bush and um and it's and it's this like exploration of of essentially bush's uh you know moral arguments that i actually which you know sounds a little silly right you know but it's I mean, that, uh, that sounds like great fun to me yeah yeah I, it is like i i remember liking it and this week i actually went back and i, I read back through some early chapters of it to kind of remind myself of what he said and um and like i i thought a lot of it was pretty good like he uh he he does and he does this the sort of things that I was mentioning earlier that um, that you know he spends a lot of time thinking about okay what are the principles that you know not everybody's a crazy utilitarian like me you know what are the principles that would appeal to other people and even if we accept them you know how much of the stuff do we have to accept uh, like so he's he um, 
he has, I think, a really nice chapter on um, on Bush's uh, like argument for tax cuts. You know, like it's your money, so it you know, so so it uh, it's justified to to give it back. And he has this nice analogy about uh, what if you um, you know, okay, so maybe Bush is thinking about this is like after we've I mean, done. It's just so empty, right? Like, of course, in some sense, it's my money, but like. You're meant to spend it on things like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, one of the points he makes and he's, he's referencing something that Thomas Nagel and a couple other people wrote about this is that the idea that there's some sort of like that, okay, there's the money that we would all have if not for state intervention is sort of deeply incoherent because uh, yeah, we'd, have, we'd have silver coins that we hide inside of our, our forts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So in fact, we are quite likely, you know, in any such society, uh, nobody would, would, would have amassed this kind of wealth uh, in the, uh, the first place. And then, you know, of course, you know, Bush isn't an anarcho capitalist. He clearly thinks that it's okay to spend a little bit of money to build roads and invade Iraq and whatnot. Uh, but um the uh but you know maybe the idea is well after the stuff that's like really super justifiable after that right then it's wrong to hold on to people's money so we should give it back with tax cuts and then singer says well maybe we could think about this like um you know maybe the kind of analogy that bush has in mind is it's like uh, a stash from a thief who's who's stolen um, you know, who's stolen ten thousand dollars in various amounts from various people, and uh, but it, by the time you recover the stash, there's only a thousand left in it. So the question is how to distribute it back to the people you stole it from. So we're accepting all of the libertarian arguments here. We're accepting the taxation is theft, but even so, the sort of Bush style tax cuts where you're giving most of the money to rich people because they would otherwise pay more. Uh, it's still pretty dubious. And so he has the example of like, what if uh, I remember the second character was named Barbara, but anyway, like Anne maybe is the first one uh, says. Uh, uh, so maybe like Anne only had $200 stolen from her and Barbara had a thousand dollars stolen from her. And so if you're just going to give everybody back 10%, then Barbara, then Anne would get 20 bucks back and uh, Barbara would get a hundred back. But maybe, um, you know, maybe because, because Anne, you know, is lacking this 200, then she's a hundred dollars short in her rent and she's going to be evicted and turned out into the streets. And Barbara spends more than the more every week on designer shoes than the total amount that was stolen from her in the first place. Uh, so given these facts, even on all the libertarian assumptions, does it really make sense that you're going to give back, um, you know, a hundred dollars to, to Barbara and only, you know, and only 20 bucks. We, to, need, we need to do a similar analysis of Joe Biden talking about how we can afford two wars. We're America. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, the, the problem with that is that, that, that analysis is, uh, I'm so confused about what the significance is supposed to be. If that premise were America. Well, we, you're, you're large, Ben. You're very large. <laughs> you're broad. Sure. America would have to pay a lot on Ben Peter Singer's airplane plans. <laughs> yeah. Now, just imagine, just imagine America's collective airplane seat and uh, how much gas uh, is taken up to uh, to transport that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's uh, yeah. This sort of like we're America. That, you know, it's that that seems to be a kind of inference ticket that lets you that lets you deduce all kinds of. Uh, interesting things um yeah, i mean there's quite a lot of those i mean there's a lot of them to do with israel <laughs> that's also true yeah a particularly bizarre one is the idea that you know whatever israel does is fine because it's the only place which is safe in the world for the jews which is so obviously not fucking true no it's obviously not true you think like like just just on when, the when, when was when was the last time eleven hundred Jews were massacred in England? Because right. I'm pretty sure it was the twelfth century. Yeah, yeah. No, honestly, yes. Uh, you know, Israel just just as a neutral matter of fact is pretty clearly a less safe place to be a Jew than any just normal Western country. 
right? And, that and, they, and uh, seemingly, you know, the decision to destroy Gaza has, you know, oh, sorry, <laughs> well, same fucking effect. Destroy Hamas, sorry, yeah. um, has led to them engaged in a low-level war with Hezbollah. Yeah, which, which makes also it even less. Does not create a safe country for the Jews. Totally, and you know, and if and and if we really got the worst case scenario here, and uh, to be, f- I don't know how fair I want to be about this. I guess uh, Biden has talked a little bit out of both sides of his mouth, but you know, he he is at least not rushing headlong into this one. But uh, the the real worst case scenario would be that war with uh, Hezbollah leads to war with Iran uh, and and the United States being involved in that, you know, which would right. be I real. mean, the U.S. is apparently sending 2,000 soldiers to Israel, which I assume will basically function as human shields. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they'll, exactly. they'll bravely get to, like, sit in places where they don't want Hezbollah to bomb. Right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's very very easy to see how this could go wrong, uh, wronger, um, but yeah, I mean, it's this is obviously like, you know, if there like any time there are three or more hate crimes in France, you know, people say, oh, see, this is why you need Israel as like a sanctuary for Jewish people. It's like, well, hold on though. Overall, who do you think is safer? Like who? Who do you think is more likely to be to be killed uh, because of their identity? A Jewish person in in Paris, or a Jewish person in West Jerusalem? A, a Jewish person who will definitely get drafted into a military which is active on two fronts, or a Jew which will not be drafted into any military at all. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that's uh. Yeah. It's such a bizarre argument, and there is. I actually saw. Um, Yesterday, my producer Jake sent me this uh, headline of some piece that um, had this uh, comparison to uh, Afro pessimism. Said uh, Judeo pessimism, which uh, which I actually think is a is a very useful term. Uh, that there's a uh, that um, this sort of well, I mean, like, that's basically anti Germanism. Yeah, pretending that like there's a uh, that there's like essentially no difference that like all times and places in the diaspora are exactly the same. And so it's like, Oh, you think you're safe in Brooklyn? Well, the Jews in Germany thought they were safe, you know, like all that stuff. That's like just presenting this timeless, a historical picture of like static Jewish insecurity that just obviously doesn't reflect uh, conditions in the real world. I mean, another one like this is when people say, we'll think that some, really important consequences flow from the premise uh, Israel's the world's only Jewish state as if, if there were two that would like be relevant to something somehow, right. That like, are they, or like, I don't know. I mean, it's like, there are uh, right. the, the zero Sikh states. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? If there was one or if there was two, like, yeah, that's like, yeah, there, there are, I mean, is that a, like is that it's in itself an argument for creating a Sikh state, right? Is the you know like like whatever arguments there might be for an independent Kurdistan, uh, it doesn't really seem like the f- the number of Kurdish states anywhere in the world currently being zero means oh no that's a problem. Oh, no, I mean, like, so I'll say you know we count the KLG as is one state. Yeah. The, the fact that didn't didn't diminish in any way the the push to create Rojava. In fact, it kind right, of right, right. because the KLG was kind of a shitty state, like Israel is, and they're actually very <laughs> close to each other. Yeah, it's like oh well, never mind. There's already one of these, so it's like yeah, no, it's like clearly in either direction, it being the only one just doesn't seem to be relevant to anything. You know, there's there's, there's no general imperative to have like at least one state with every possible, you know, ethnic majority. And there's, you know, like, okay, well, at least we've met that imperative or, Oh no, we haven't met it yet. So we have to, you know, it just, that just seems sort of, you know, flatly irrelevant to, to anything, you know, on the face of it, which is, and, you know, also this whole question of like, um, you know, Israel being, you know, the, a capital J capital S Jewish state is, is also, you know, one of my gripes about singer that like, I think he has a, um, uh, that, you know, he, 
his little summary at the beginning of his article of the history of the conflict, um, you know, goes all the way back to the 1990s. Uh, but um, I, I think misses some important stuff before that. But in, you know, most of what he says in it is fine. But I mean, it's like, but the whole presentation is like, mm-hmm. oh, well, once upon a time, there was the Rabin government, which was like nice and reasonable. And like now there's this like crazy, unreasonable uh, Netanyahu government. And it's like, okay, but like you, ha- you haven't like, like it doesn't seem to have crossed his mind that there's something about the very project of an ethno state where, you know, something that like it's that the idea is that it's not just going to be a state that, you know, happens to have one ethno religious majority at one time, maybe as population shed patterns change, it'll have a different I mean, one. It's like that thing with make America great again, right? Yeah. It's like, when was Israel good? When was the good Israel time? <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, yeah, yeah. Eighty thousands. I don't know. Like, yeah, it can't, it can't be any time up to 1973 when the Jews there were under existential threat, basically all the time. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, but it's like that there's something sort of in that project, right, that it's like this isn't just going to be a state for whoever happens to live in there, which is the general liberal democratic idea about how states should work. But um, this is the state of this collective entity, the Jewish people, that, you know, is – strikes me as sort of inherently lending itself to uh to mistreatment of the population that's inconvenient for uh for that purpose right so that that you know again that just doesn't seem to cross his mind so i mean so, and also kind of intensive mistreatment of of kind of bits of that state of that alleged people who aren't interested in the project right like, yeah. like those crazy ultra orthodox people in East Jerusalem who constantly get like beaten up by the Israeli police. Uh, yeah, like the the Terry Carter. Yeah, the um, yeah. I mean, and then or even like the um, I mean, those are the sort of yeah. I mean, those are the sort of crazy fringe. I mean, there's also like the yeah, I mean, sap- just, just Israeli leftists who yeah, 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 totally right. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, right? also the people getting abused right now, which are just the parents of the people that are being kidnapped and so on. Yeah, yeah, parents of hostages because obviously a lot of them would like there to be a ceasefire to prisoner exchange so they can like yeah, see so their they, children they, again. It traces to Israel by caring about Jewish lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, I mean, lately, um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this. Like some of the some of the most recent stuff uh, is uh, is that the um, is that the Israeli government has, which is sort of gotten progressively more illiberal in you know the last year in particular uh has has announced some um some really wild stuff about how they're going to start arresting people for like saying things that are bad for the national morale um so i mean i I don't know if it's true but al jazeera have, have said that last night israel refused to receive some hostages from hamas because obviously yeah. Hamas, Hamas have a like kind of, I assume they're doing a deliberate thing where they slowly, yeah. they're trying to slowly drip feed hostages out right. to delay the war, which right, yeah, yeah. Good, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, so, so connecting some of the dots here, it's like, I think when, you know, Peter Singer is talking about, taxation or like in that bush book when he's talking about um you know stem cells and the death penalty and all that stuff uh i i think he actually i think he actually makes uh like very good and very careful arguments and so the question that i'm interested in asking here is okay then why does he talk all this stupid bullshit about this, you know, what's, uh, what, what's going on there. And, and I think that, um, you know, as much as like, you know, I always like a good chance to take a swipe at utilitarianism. I think that in a way that's actually kind of the opposite of the problem here, right? Because you, you would think that whatever, you know, whatever there is to be said sort of for or against utilitarianism as a general ethical position, if you're, it, if it you're wouldn't just be ginning up like a defense of the exact present state of affairs. Yeah, I mean, it would be more like vegan Hamas. Yeah, I mean, if you're really gonna take, if you're really gonna take 
utilitarianism seriously, then that should actually increase your obligation to sort of think hard about how power and violence work in the real world and and what thus like what the likely consequences not just you know immediately but you know in the in the long term are going to be of of different policies and so the question essentially to me is why isn't peter singer doing that right why why is he you know, why is he joining the ranks of the vapid Western liberals who are sort of talking themselves into supporting uh, war crimes uh, in, uh, in Gaza? And, and I think that I actually think that like part of the answer here is that even though, right, you know, he's allegedly utilitarian, uh, ultimately, look, what is Peter Singer actually good at? And what he's good at and this is not this in itself is not a dig on him. I mean, it just makes sense. What he's good at ultimately is like making a priori arguments, like which is which is the the thing that he is academically trained to do. And fair enough, right? But um, yeah, I like think, his most famous thing is about a hypothetical drowning child, and that one's really fucking good. That one's no, a kill, is. which like just killed like that sets shockwaves to ethics. And, how, and basically, everyone has to be like, yeah, I guess you're right, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like everybody's like, even if you're not sort of fully convinced by it, it's sort of uh, everybody seems to be at least troubled uh, by his. Yeah, like, uh, it seems true. Like, yeah, by his, by his point, because there's some obvious the, 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 the basic point for the, the chat is it doesn't really seem to actually match if you think about it how far away a child is for how much it like its life matters to you should matter to you. Yeah, if you have a like, if you're like. Uh, you know, if you're wearing a, um, if you're wearing an expensive suit and you walk by a lake where a child is drowning, and you keep watching, walk in because you don't want to ruin your nice suit by wading in to save the drowning child, right? That's monstrous. Uh, but uh, but hold on, uh, aren't you making the very same trade off and buying the suit in the first place as opposed to like giving money to famine relief charities? That's the that that's roughly. Uh, singer's point and it's like yeah no i mean that that is that is something that people have really had to grapple with because it's like this is he's not again you don't have to assume utilitarianism he's not like assuming anything like that right he's he's just saying look by you guys's lights if you share my intuition on the on the original point what exactly is the relevant difference really spell it out for me and uh it turns out that's very hard to do right um yeah, and- because both ch- children are strangers to you and yeah. the defenses of it based on like, you know, well, as an American child, just you would say racist. And so, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, right. Yeah. So there, there doesn't seem to be a good, uh, yeah, no, exactly. Right. So it's like, okay, so this is understandably what he's good at, um, you know, cause again, this is, this is, this is what his academic training is in and, and, you know, and I don't have a, I mean, you know, to reiterate, I like philosophy. I'm all for studying philosophy, but I think there is a bit of a cautionary tale here. Uh, apparently not. Uh, there is a cautionary tale here about um, about the perils of somebody who has that training sort of going forth and commenting on the world without supplementing that with a good understanding of, as I said earlier, how the, how power and violence work in the actual material world, right? That they, uh, that if you're, you know, the, the tagline of the piece, I mean, if you're just kind of trying to navigate current events armed with nothing, but you know, uh, a moral intuition or two and, um, and, and whatever you kind of glean from, you know, the headlines you saw on Twitter or, you know, what you read in the, the New York times that morning. Uh, it's very easy to go disastrously wrong. Cause, cause you're not thinking about stuff like, hold on though. Is it really that there's like a destroy Hamas button or, uh, or could it actually be the case that, uh, you know, a, attempting to destroy Hamas uh, through this, you know, lane siege, to this place and indiscriminately bombing it will actually further radicalize 
uh, a new generation of yeah. Of I young think it will create an incredibly uh, home, uh, incredibly safe home for the Jews. Yes, exactly. Yes, they, this will only lead to you know, like incredible, generally incredible Jew safety. Generally speaking, when people's um, you know, like the the reaction of most human beings to uh, to you know seeing. Uh, you know, seeing their little sister blown up uh, when their apartment uh, their apartment complex is bombed, and uh, and having their parents be trapped under the rubble, and then you know you and grandma escape to uh, to hide out in a church somewhere, and that's bombed. Is well, I'm glad that's over with. Uh, now I'm uh, you know now I'm going to go forward and live in peace with the people who did that to me. Um, did you see this Sam Harris thing? The person was asking about. Uh, yeah. Was so some... thought another thing about Sam Harris, where he basically blamed the Jews for the Holocaust. Did you see that? No. What did he say? Well, he basically said um, that anti-Semitism in Europe was induced by the fact that Jews deliberately kind of ghettoized themselves, which, beyond anything else, is also like historically wrong. Because political anti-Semitism as a thing emerged in the 19th century after Napoleon had removed the Jews in Europe from the ghetto and, and emancipated them. Yeah. Um, yeah, We've that's 250 wild. live viewers, by the way. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Um, you know, of course, not as bad as, uh, I mean, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu is... Uh, not of course a Holocaust denier, but it's kind of a Holocaust revisionist. He has this, uh, yeah. He, he has this weird. If he, if he wasn't the, the president of Israel, he would be condemned in Germany as a Holocaust uh, was it relativist? Well, because because Netanyahu has this like weird belief that like the Palestinians made the Nazis do the Holocaust, yes. and it's the it's the well, it, it's kind of the, this same kind of amazing. Uh, power that Hamas has to be the only political actor in in Palestine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like sort of it's like yeah, no, it's the there's this you know the you know look Hitler took his marching orders from the Mufti of Jerusalem. I mean the Mufti says you know jump. Uh, Hitler says how high. Um, yeah. So okay. So I did not see the Harris Holocaust thing. Um, that's uh, I did so. I also have not seen um, the Glenn Lowry, John McWhorter, and Colin Hughes thing. Um, you know, <laughs> Coleman Hughes might be one of the right-leading people that I usually hate the least, but uh, it does seem like he's been pretty bad on this. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, in any case, uh, I have read Harris's article, Why I Don't Criticize Israel. I read that a long time ago. Uh, I was helping Michael with Against the Web. Uh, and it's 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 extremely crazy, but, and I don't know, maybe it is worth writing something about it at some point, but it's like, that one strikes me as kind of a case of what we were talking about earlier, that like, I mean, that's not even, I don't know how much that's even Harris, like, you don't think sort it's like intellectually interesting? Yeah, it's like that. That just seems like Harris like started out with this like kind of general bias in terms, but towards thinking that Israel is fine, and like he just kind of hasn't let thinking about it shake him from it, right? Like that's <laughs> <laughs> like, like which is sort of crazy on the face of it, right? Because it's like given Harris's professed principles. Um, he should not think. That is he a Gentile? Right. No, no, he's a Jew. Oh, okay, didn't know. Um, yeah, he, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, very um, not not exactly obviously Jewish last name, or you know, uh, but um, but yeah, he is. And of I, course, I like a crusader against evangelical Christians in the early yeah, 2000s. yeah. I mean, that I mean, he's a look. I mean, famously, he's a. You know, I mean, he's an anti-theist, right? That's that's how we all heard of him in the first place uh, yeah. in the uh, New Atheism era. Um, and so it's like, given that, I mean, the fact that this is a state that 
like foundationally practices religious discrimination um that you know your your rights to to uh to immigrate there um are changed dramatically if you convert to the right religion uh that's uh that you know whereas people who were expelled from their homes in 1948 and have the wrong religion uh have uh you know like not only you know don't don't have a right to to return you know but i mean like like they like literally are like stopped from like visiting uh that 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 should you know i mean and just generally speaking the fact that look i <laughs> i think uh you know, me and a couple of friends of mine, uh, way back in 2016, I remember, uh, you know, years before I was doing any sort of podcast, uh, had a long conversation one night about the, um, how we should start a podcast called Sam Harris is wrong about everything. Uh, and it was, I, was just, I was just looking at the, the Holocaust thing and it does actually come out of antitheism. It would just be like, uh, yeah, it would just uh, it would just be go into uh, uh, it's like oh here's the stuff Sam Harris was wrong about this week uh, and uh, so like look I don't particularly like uh, a lot of a lot of what Sam Harris believes but like even given what he officially believes he shouldn't believe this he's like uh, like 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 Sam Harris is supposed to be all about the sort of general principles of liberal democracy which uh taken seriously would actually i mean forget a two-state solution would 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 mean that you should want there to be a one-state solution that you know everybody uh everybody just gets equal rights um and you know it, it's it, you know the, the fact that um like where else is sam harris willing to um you know willing to endorse like ethno nationalism i mean this is like he uh you know he has this kind of yes i've read the article he has kind of a tortured explanation that ignores a lot of inconvenient things of why of why this is actually totally consistent with everything that he believes but i mean like ultimately it just kind of it just kind of strikes me more as like this is one of the political beliefs that he started life with and you know he's uh and you know and and he's not gonna you know He's not going to give My it up. My God, to, I'm not going to change. You know, he's not going to give it up just because it's obviously cons- inconsistent with the rest of what he thinks. Um, so very, yeah. uh, very facey of him. Yeah, um, I mean, it's 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 like he has, and I mean, like the part that does fit, I suppose, with the rest of his views is that uh, oddly enough, because usually Harris talks like a dyed in the wool utilitarian, like a a uh, very straightforward act utilitarian. Uh, he does seem to suddenly start believing in all these non-moral, non-utilitarian, like doctor of double effect kinds of principles, whatever one of the countries that he likes is bombing people right. uh, that, you know, intentions suddenly become extremely important to him. And uh, that's in, so in the mass could have only attacked those military posts, but in the, in doing so they shot the rave. Is that permissible? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. If they were shooting a missile at a military post, that the path went through it. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it, it's uh, like so. Like that part's, I suppose, consistent as far as it goes uh, between at least his views about the U.S. and Israel. But like, you know, generally speaking, um, the his indifference to religious discrimination and his, you know, tacit support for. Uh, for ethnic nationalism, uh, you know, seem like yeah, they, they seem to be very much at odds with, uh, with with his generally proclaimed principles. But like, also, I don't know, Sam Harris is, just strikes me as a person who, you know, you can read most of his views just off of like, you know, what would, um, you know, if if like you just meet a bunch of really shitty liberals in Santa Monica, and it's like, oh, what do they think? Right. That's like um, probably more, you know, of the right generation. So, you know, you don't get anything too woke in there. Right. Then like um, then it's like, yeah, what do those guys think? Then you'll get at least a range of what Sam Harris is going to say about every question. Can you can you guess what the, the conclusion to this sentence is that he's written? I've written that the Jews are in part responsible for, for the Holocaust. That's part of my... 
<laughs> Psychosis? Denigration of belief of faith-based religions. <laughs> that is, that is ultimately, I remember uh, PZ Myers uh, has this phrase, you know, that's very useful, the Harris shuffle, where, uh, you know, Harris will say intentionally provocative things, people will get mad, and he'll say, oh, all I meant was, and then he like just strips it down to the most minimal possible interpretation of the uh, the thing that he just said. Um, so, you know, like, um, I think this might actually be a quote from the end of faith. Uh, we may have to use torture in our current war on terror. People get mad. I said, no, 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 all I'm saying is there are certain ticking time bomb hypotheticals in which, right. you know, torture would be justified which, which applies to uh, zero of the cases of anything yeah. over down in or whatever yeah yeah exactly um so like yeah that that is just such a perfect you know it's like and, and it's like you can kind of feel him like smirking it's like oh you know look at what i said that's going to outrage all the simpletons you know that's uh it's like i have written that the jews are partially responsible for the holocaust what do you think about that sir it's like oh oh, oh hey calm down all it meant was <laughs> so i bought a new webcam today yeah. um it's quite I'm, I'm quite golden and shiny so that's nice um outside the store for the, the shop i was going into to buy this there was a man that was asking for money for people like, it was very obvious what he was doing as I was approaching. Um, oh. And I get up to him, and he stops me too, and I, I stop, and we start talking. And he's clearly asking for money, and I think he's going to be asking money for, like, well, you know, it isn't, you know maybe he's going to spend it on drugs or whatever. Um, but he looked pretty normal. But um, I assume he's going to ask, tell me that he needs it for, like, bus fare or something like this. Sure. Um, do you know what he's, he asked me for money for? What, what, what was it? Nike Air Force Ones. He needed to buy Nike Air Force Ones, which that, I don't know how much they cost in the US, but they, that's they're 110 Nike. pounds. Yeah, Nikes. Yeah. He needed to buy fresh ass Nikes. He specifically said, I need them for tomorrow. I'm 10 pounds off. Can you give me 10 pounds? I need to buy 110 pound <laughs> shoes. Did you ask what he needed them for tomorrow? No, because I just collapsed laughing at him. <laughs> I'm going to start doing, uh, yeah, no, that'd be amazing. It's like if, uh, you know, have the, um, yes, it's like, um, yeah, stand, uh, it's like, oh, uh, I'm a, hey, man, I really hate to have to ask, uh, but, I am I am a dollar fifty short for this uh, this bottle of Lagavulin uh, that, uh, that that I need. Right? That's, uh, like, yeah, I'm a dollar fifty off like the top shelf stuff. Yeah, yeah. I can't it's, possibly buy like a middle shelf bottle. Yeah, it's like yeah. What do you think I'm gonna do? Drink Glenfiddich like some kind of peasant? No, what I, what I need is this, and I'm a dollar fifty off for it. Uh, can you help me out? <laughs> Um, so, so Ben, what's on the docket for next week? Uh, next week, uh, <laughs> there is going to be a guest post. Uh, we've had two of those before. Uh, one was by uh, Tibor Rutar. Uh, one was by Eric Levitz. Uh, this one is... Um, so, yeah, Tibor is based in Slovenia. Eric lives in the United States. This one is by a Brit. Uh <laughs> It's uh, it's going to, I believe, call, be called in defense of military age males about Michael Walzer and the ethics of killing soldiers, uh, written by one uh, Stefan Bertram Lee. I've I've clearly caught the Ben disease because it's currently sitting at thirty four hundred words, and I still need to write the conclusion, which will be my longest essay ever. Yeah, um, if, you could, if you could cut that down a little bit, uh, that yeah, no, I, I definitely will. But uh, I, I'm just, I just find it funny that I, yeah. I never, my essays are normally always 2K, and then I've, I've come onto the, the Ben scene, and I'm just, I'm like, I, you know, I have for the last, it's been, it's been a few months at least. No, this, this one was short. Yeah, no, I've more. been, this is, so for the last, I don't remember exactly how long it's been, but for at least the last couple months, I think a few months, I've been, um, uh maybe sometimes anyway they have however long it's been for the for a while i've been 
capping them out at 3000 words at absolute yeah. max, which means that like, um, you know, last night, uh, I was, I was, I'd finished at 11 PM, you know, LA time. And, uh, and, and then I spent, I spent the hours between 11 PM and 1 AM, uh, cutting it down, uh, to 3000 words. Cause, uh, cause it was, the it was originally significantly longer than that uh and that's 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 like pretty much always the case that's like i have an other than other than um i guess i let tibor go on like 200 words longer or something because it's like uh okay fine i'm not you know i i don't really want to like have to uh have to meddle with this that much right but it's like uh and and eric you know was very short but like in the um that was like 1500 words or something, but in the, uh, but for just about all of mine, since I started, started, um, capping it at 3000 words, I've been like, it's like exactly 3000 or like maybe, or like, yeah, maybe it's like 2,995. Cause like when I figured out the last sentence I could cut, it brought it down to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm quite looking forward to having to actually cut something because I never really have to. I think it's yeah. quite fun to, to slice and chop and, and realize which bits yeah, are yeah. I think I'll have yeah, to no. just go down from like 50 examples to 25. Yeah. <laughs> no, it definitely almost always makes the end result better. But um, yeah, chat, you have to look forward to me making the argument uh, that there's no real way to make a really principled distinction for why it's fine to kill soldiers but it's not fine to kill civilians. Uh, but luckily I'm not a US Army general or I'm not in the IDF. So the conclusion of that is not that we should just kill both as much as we want. Yeah, I mean, I my intuition is that it's at least worse, but uh, I expect we'll have plenty to get into next week. <laughs> Bye, everyone.